Hi, and welcome to Green Planet, Blue Planet podcast, highlighting artists, teachers, authors, and philanthropists of the regenerative movement. People who are committed to and showcase qualities of planetary leadership. My name is Julian Guderlei. I'm a transformational coach, a breathwork teacher, and committed to a world that allows people from all walks of life to thrive. I'm your host and creator of Green Planet, Blue Planet podcast. And in today's episode, I'm hosting an interview with Ron Guerin. Ron, as a part of a select group of individuals, has been fortunate enough to see the world from space. And he champions his orbital perspective message to improve life on Earth. Ron is celebrated not just for his research in space, but also for his humanitarian contribution to life on Earth. He spent 178 days in space and has traveled more than 71 million miles during orbit of our planet. He flew on both US space shuttles and the Russian Soyuz spacecraft, where he accomplished four spacewalks. Ron also spent 18 days at the bottom of the ocean during a research mission held in the world's only undersea research lab, Aquarius. And so with these words, let's talk about the planetary perspective. Welcome to the show, Ron. Hi, Julian. Great, great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, absolutely. I'm fascinated with what you've experienced, which is the overview effect, the, you know, looking back onto Earth and, and, and realizing that this is, this is maybe way different than the stories we grew up with. And, and so um, maybe walk us a little bit through your story at the beginning here. Like, you know, you were also um, a, a fighter pilot, right? Like you, you, were, you went underwater to practice and train. You went out into space. This is something very few people have had the fortunate um, experience to have. So, so maybe walk us a little bit how that began and, and um, when you knew that this is going to be your life and you're going to just make it happen. Yeah. Well, I think the journey began on July 20th, 1969. And <laughs> it was uh, on that day where I, as a small boy, along with millions and millions of people around the world, watched the first footsteps on the moon. And I think that to me was a, was a, a calling, I think. Uh, you know, I, I had this deep sense that I wanted to follow in the footsteps of uh, the Apollo astronauts. I wanted to be able to step off the planet and look back at ourselves. Um, you know, I, I think at some level I realized, and I wouldn't have been able to put it in these words at the time, but at some level I realized that we had just become a different species. We were a species no longer confined to our planet, and, and I wanted to be a, you know, a part of that group of explorers. And um, that set up a, a journey that you know, took many twists and turns. Um, I, I, you know, the dream of, of becoming an astronaut uh, and flying in space uh, came true about four decades after that, <laughs> when I launched into space on, on board Space Shuttle Discovery back in 2008. Um, but the path was, was somewhat, I mean, it had, you know, twists and turns, but it was somewhat traditional. Traditional in that, you know, I, I joined the military, I was an Air Force fighter pilot, I fought in combat in, in Operation Desert Storm. Uh, I was a Cold War fighter pilot, uh, stationed in your home country of uh, Germany. Uh, it was West Germany at the time. Uh, it was before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and we were, you know, part of the mutually assured destruction deterrence force. Um, and then uh, eventually became a test pilot. And I was selected uh, from the ranks of, uh, of test pilots to, um, to join the astronaut uh, corps. And so um, that's the, the path it took. Once I, I joined uh, the astronaut corps, uh, did fly on the, on the space shuttle. Uh, our first mission in 2008, the mission objective was to bring up and install the Japanese laboratory to the International Space Station. And on that mission, uh, as part of that construction, uh, I did uh, three spacewalks um, uh, supporting the construction. Uh, and then in 2011, I launched on a Russian Soyuz spacecraft and I launched on the 50th anniversary of uh, Yuri Gagarin's flight, the first human in space. And we launched from the very same launch pad that Yuri Gagarin launched from. And uh, that took us to the space station for a six month mission. I'm and getting chills as you're saying this, like my whole body <laughs> is like experiencing it with you. <laughs> what's, what's really interesting, and we could get into this a little bit if you want, is that if you would have told me back, you know, when I was in my 20s that I would eventually, you know, become an astronaut, my dream of becoming an astronaut were true, and I would one day fly in, in space on a, a space shuttle, I would have thought that was amazing. If you would have told me that I would also one day become a fully integrated member of a Russian spacecraft crew and launch from a previous top secret Soviet military installation uh, to space, I would have thought you were insane. It was not mm. one of the possibilities that that could happen. Uh, it was it was impossible, but 
lo and behold, I was there. And what was really interesting about that is you, you imagine that I spent the first 15 years of my adult life training to fight the Russians, mm -hmm. America's most menacing enemy at the time. And then I find myself on a cold April evening uh, at the base of a, of, a, a launch, of a rocket on a launch pad. Uh, and I look up at this rocket and it's, you know, it's bathed in, in spotlights. It's in the middle of the night. Uh, and again, it was from, it's from this previous top secret Soviet military installation. And up on the top of the rocket is an American flag and a Russian flag side by side. Wow. And I got a glimpse in that moment of what our planetary society could be, of, of, of an emerging planetary community where, where um, we're able to set aside our differences and, and do amazing things, awe-inspiring things together. Um, and so that, that image of those two flags side by side was really burned into me. And it, it was a glimpse, it was a little glimpse, uh, but it was a glimpse nonetheless. Yeah, I, I, lo I love that. I think this is really worth unpacking because you know, you said it like it's, it's maybe the, especially in the American perspective, most traditional pathway to join the military, you know, fly, fly the planes and then be selected, et cetera. But, but basically being trained to have enemies to then one day realize, actually, where there are no enemies, we, we got to work together, right? Like for, for me, I, I wasn't fortunate enough yet maybe to go into space, but that happened for the first time truly when I was an international exchange student and I went to Paraguay and South America as, as a teenager, as a really young boy actually. And I just realized, yeah, wow, everyone's just different. That's, that's for sure. But that doesn't actually mean anything. It just means we bring different skills to the table. So, so how is the atmosphere maybe when you're in this kind of uh, enclave of, of astronauts that are from all different nations? Like, right. Yeah. So, so let me just back up to something you said, because I, I think it's really, really important. There are, you said there are no enemies, and that's true. There are no true enemies. There's differences. And what we tend to do is create enemies out of those. We, we manufacture enemies out of those differences. And a good example of, of how not to do that is the International Space Station program itself. And so back when the uh, Americans and, and the Russian and Japanese partners um, uh, were thinking about allowing the Russians to be part of this partnership. Uh, in America, there was a lot of detractors. I'm sure there were detractors outside of America too, but um, I'm familiar with the ones in America that were saying, why do we think we should be doing anything with the Russians? The Russians are doing X, Y, and Z. Until they stop doing X, Y, and Z, we shouldn't have anything to do with them, right? And what we normally do is we normally take things that we agree on like space exploration, and we use it as a, as a stick to force the things that we don't agree on. But that's, in this particular case, we found something that we agreed on and we used it as a common jump off point. And so luckily those, those detractors didn't win out. We, the, the Russians did join the International Space Station program. And what happened there is relationships started to develop, um, a, a foundation of trust started to develop. And now we have this foundation that if we so choose, we can use as a jump off point to address the things that we don't agree on. Right? We're not, no, no person, no, no two people and no two countries are gonna agree on everything, right? But what's, what the International Space Station uh, program proved is that if we find the low hanging fruit, find the things that we agree on and work on those, then you know we have a path to progress. We have a path to, to unity. We have a path to, to being able to work together to solve our shared problems, right? And so to answer your question about how things work on the, on the space station, is on the space station, there's not the American crew and the Russian crew and the German crew and the Japanese crew and the Canadian crew. There's just the crew. We have a mission. We have to accomplish the mission. And we work together as a unified crew that just happens to be from different nations, right? And one of the main objectives while we're up there is to maintain uh, and protect the life support systems of the space station that keep us alive. And so a good lesson to bring back to Earth is just like we work together as a unified international crew on board the, the space station to protect life support systems of the ISS, we need to work as, an inter, as a combined unified international crew here on the surface of the Earth to protect the life support systems of spaceship Earth because we're all riding through the universe together on this spaceship that we call Earth, right? And so that should be pretty obvious. Let me ask out of pure, like sheer curiosity here, is, is that something that's just extremely present for you in everyday life that we are literally floating in blackness? Yes, I wake up, I, so I use this, I have this new book coming out, it's called Floating in Darkness, and I, and I stole a term <laughs> called Z Dolly Zoom. And Dolly Zoom is a term in, in cinematography that, that means um, 
dollying back or rolling back a camera as the same time as you're zooming it in. It's, it was used in, in uh, Vertigo and Jaws and, you know, a lot. And what that does is it, it expands, it expands the viewer's sense of reality, right? It challenges their, their, their perception of reality. It, it, it keeps the, the foreground, you know, in, in focus where, where the background is expanding, right? And so I, I borrowed that term in my, in my new book to describe what we need to do when addressing situations and challenges on the earth. We need to dolly zoom them, which, and what I mean by that is we need to zoom out to the widest perspective possible, uh, where all the players come into view, all the pieces of the puzzle come into view, everybody who's affected in, in any way comes into view. But as we zoom out, we don't lose the worm's eye details on the ground. We don't, we don't zoom out to the point where people become numbers on a spreadsheet, right? We, that people stay as, as valued members of, of the human family. And so this dolly zoom is not just uh, spatially, it's also temporally. We, we need to zoom out to the longest term possible, uh, which is multi-generational. So we're gonna, we're gonna make a decision. How is that gonna affect you know, our grandkids' grandkids, right? 100%, but, yeah. Yeah, but, but as we do that, we can't lose the short term. We can't, lead, we can't make decisions that le lead to short term disaster because of, of, of long term. So they have to, you have to balance, you have to keep both in focus, right? And so, um, you know, that's the term. Now I forgot the, 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 the initial question. <laughs> well, you already answered it with, with yes, which was the, the short answer, which is just the, the understanding that we're actually floating in blackness. Like we're oh, yeah. on a spaceship, right? Like, and, and bringing this right. into everyday life, which I think for some people, especially, you know, you have the, the situation that you've experienced it. So it might, it might be in there quite a bit stronger, but for some people it's like, well, why should I even think of that? I have so much to do right. here. But the perspective it gives us, what you just you kind of narrated us into is... Yeah, but where I was leading to that, and I, and I, and I forgot where my, my train of thought was, that, that I try, I strive every day to live every moment in a dolly zoomed state. So every morning I wake up in my bed, uh, but I also wake up on a planet. So mm -hmm. you know, I, I try and keep one foot on the ground and one, and one foot in space, if you will, or keep, you know, keep part keep my awareness not only on the ground, but in the, in the bigger picture. I to love it. It. I'm, I, I've got, you know, my daily commute, although not lately, you know, the bills that I have to pay, the things that I have to do every day, you know, but I also have to keep the big picture in, in view at the same time. So I have to, I have to live my life in a Dolly Zoom state and I strive to do that. Powerful answer. And I love it. And, and you know, you, you couldn't have known this, but one of the questions that usually comes at the very end of my, my podcast interviews is, what is your dream or vision for our planet when you take a seven generational point of view, the, the point of view that you already kind of explained, like zooming out also generationally. So it's beyond the ego and the experience of Julian or, or Ron. It's, it's for the, the health and the, the sanity of our entire spaceship here. And so maybe let's just uh, dig a little deeper there. Like what's in your, you know, in your heart and mind space, like what is the dream that we can, step-by-step step achieve i know you have heard you speak before and you speak about this planetary you know shift almost like we're we're in between two big eras yeah so i hope seven generations from now we look back at 2020 and realize that we were in a, an inflection point we were in the great transition you know there's all this talk about another great depression but i think we're which which may happen but I think what is certain, at least in, from my point of view, is that we are in the midst of a, of a great transition. And so I, I truly believe that we're in an inflection point between two human epochs. And I think actually the catalyst, if I could, if I could tra you know, trace you know, this inflection point, it goes back to December 24th, 1968. I think that's the actual, the actual specific moment of the inflection point. And on that moment, uh, on Christmas Eve, 1968, a photograph was taken that I think changed the world. And that was the Earthrise photograph taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts as they came up from behind the far side of the moon on their fourth orbit. And they witnessed the Earth emerging from behind the lunar horizon. So the, uh, those guys at that moment became the first humans in history to see the whole planet hanging in the blackness of space and, and the first to, to capture that for the rest of us. And, and this 1968 was a, was a really troubling year. There was, there was political assassinations. There was massive unrest in the streets of America, Europe, and most of the world. 
uh, there was a lot of instability. You know, the, 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 it was the you know, Cold War was there. We, we had, you know, all these nuclear weapons pointed at each other. It was, a, it was a really, really scary time. But I think Apollo 8 and the Earthrise photograph was, was, the, was the beacon of hope um, in, in 1968. Um, and right now, if we fast forward to 2020, you know, we're in the midst of a worldwide upheaval. You know, there's massive unrest in the streets. You, um, but what, what's, I think, different now is I think for, for the first time in history, this moment in time, the entire world is faced with an existential threat that's undeniable. We've mm -hmm. been faced with many existential threats before, but this one is undeniable. There's literally not a person on the planet that is not affected one way or another by COVID-19, for instance. And so this, this cliche, you know, we're all in this together is obviously more than a cliche. It, there's deep, deep truth in that, that we really, really are all in this together. And so, you know, one other way to look at this inflection point is from a biological point of view. And, and closed biological systems have a standard you know, population graph, if you will. It, it normally starts out really, really flat. You know, there's not a lot of increase in population. Some event happens and it just goes through the roof and it spikes up and goes off exponentially. And then one of two things happen. Either it comes crashing back down because, because the, the organisms uh, deplete the, the, the living system that they're part of, or they reach some kind of equilibrium and then, and then can continue to thrive in a, in a state of equilibrium. So right around 1968, we hit the inflection point where our rate of acceleration stopped accelerating <laughs> of population growth, right? So, so we're, I mean, we're still, we're still growing uh, at, a, at a, a very fast rate. Uh, and projections have us at about 10 billion, uh, you know, within the next, uh, I think, 10 years or so, or, or by 2030, I think. Um, but what, what we need to understand is that whatever that number is of, of an equilibrium state of population, we have to be living within the planetary limits of, of, of what we have on Earth. Um, and so I, I think, you know, seven, de seven generations um, in the future, hopefully they look back at this time and realize that we took the proper steps to make sure that we reached a state of equilibrium and we didn't come crashing back down um, and, and basically destroy life on the planet. That's a powerful answer. I'll, I'll let that just drop in a little deeper. Yeah. You know, I can only imagine what it would be to look back on, on planet earth and see, you know, the magnificence and see also the fragility and also understand like, we're literally in this all together. It's, it's not a cliche. It's, it's a logical consequence once you're seeing it from, from out there. Um, it's maybe not how we got conditioned and trained to perceive the world that we're all in this together, right? We, we, we usually grow up in separation consciousness and the different nation state identities. And um, maybe there used to be a time where this made sense. <laughs> I think at this point in 2020, it's almost in the way to, create uh this this yeah resonance point or this you know you call it like equilibrium point that allows 8 billion or 10 billion people to live healthily on a planet i'm sure you have a, a lot to share on, on that idea um if there's anything else like please, yeah. please jump in yeah so i do i do a lot of public speaking around the world um most of it's virtual now that we have COVID 19 um but i i, I use a juxtaposition of two images to to basically illustrate the point that you just made. And the, the first image is the map of the world that hangs in classrooms, you know, across the planet. Uh, it's, it's a, you know, this multicolored map with all the different countries. And it's, what it is in reality is it's a two-dimensional landscape of nation states fighting and competing over uh, resources and ideologies. And it's a, it's a landscape where not only nations compete, but, but corporations and NGOs and special interest groups and political parties and, and, and all of this. And then I juxtapose that image with the image of Earthrise. And, and the image of Earthrise is the real world. It's the real interdependent, interconnected uh, fabric of life uh, that knows no borders um, and boundaries and barriers. And it's, it's the unified image. And the, the old image, the, the two-dimensional landscape, um, which by the way, if we're using two-dimensional landscape as our guidepost for our actions that leads to two-dimensional thinking, right? It leads to two-dimensional us versus them thinking, which yeah, is exactly what we are right now. But that, that two-dimensional map may have served us in the past. You know, it may have been appropriate before we realized 
how interdependent we all are. It may have been appropriate before we realized that humans could destroy the very life support systems of our planet. It may have been appropriate uh, when nations can operate, could operate in, in relative isolation, but it's no longer the, the appropriate guidepost for our actions. The appropriate guidepost for our actions is the image of Earthrise in its multidimensional, you know, deep interconnected, interdependent reality. And so, you know, we face really uh, extremely challenging real problems uh, and the only way we're going to solve them is in the context of the real world. We can't use this old outdated thing. And so if, if that two-dimensional map in the, in the classrooms is the, is the guidepost of the old human epoch, then, then Earthrise is the, is the guidepost for the new, new human epoch. And uh, it, it underlying that, that image, inherent in that image is our underlying unity that, that, that we're all part of. And when I was in space, it was really interesting, you know, being physically detached from the earth in some way that I can't really explain made me feel deeply interconnected uh, with everyone on it, not only interconnected, but interdependent. And, you know, in, in my book, I, I, Floating in Darkness, um, the one that's, that's about to come out, I use, the, I use the autobiographical narrative of my own story to, uh, to serve as a metaphor for the, the evolution of society, not only wherever we've been, but, but where we need to go. And, you know, there, are, there were a lot of um, situations in my own life that I think uh, we, we could draw upon. Like most of my, the first probably 25 years of my life, I lived a very tribal existence. Uh, tribalism was, was a huge thing, whether that's the tribalism of, of being in the military, of fighting in combat, of uh, I mean, there's tribalism associated with sports. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's all this. And we tend uh, to be very tribal by nature. And, and, we, and we normally define uh, our tribe, if you will, as those that we share our home with or our community with, right? Those that we've identified with. And so what's going to be required, I think, to evolve and to be, you know, seven generations down and be able to look back at this moment as the inflection point that led to the equilibrium that we, that, that thriving equilibrium that we need to get to is our expansion of the definition of our tribe to encompass the entire earth. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll, I'll just tell you a quick story that I think is Please, cool. yeah. when my six month mission was, was coming to an end. Uh, my two Russian crewmates and I climbed into our Soyuz spacecraft. You know, we put on our, our space suits. We closed the hatch, undocked from the space station. Uh, we did a couple of laps around the planet. And as we crossed the, the south tip of South America, we fishtailed our, our spacecraft around to point the engines in, in the direction of our travel, right? We fired the engines that, that slowed us down enough to enter the upper atmosphere. We had this fiery, violent ride through the atmosphere at five miles a second. Uh, the parachutes opened and threw us all over the place. Eventually, we smashed into the ground and we hit really hard. We hit so hard that we bounced and we rolled and we flipped over. And now my window, I had a window right by my head. My window was pointed down at, at the ground. And out of my window, I saw a rock, a flower, and a blade of grass. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm home. And I was, really interested. I was home for after six months. And what was really interested about, interesting about that thought was I was home, but I was in Kazakhstan. And so to me at that moment, my home wasn't just Houston, Texas, where at the time I lived with my family, home was earth. And our definition of that word home has profound implications for how we problem solve, how we, how we treat our planet, how we treat each other. And what, what I learned through that experience was that broadening our definition of the word home does not come with it a requirement to forget where we came from, our national, our political, our cultural, our religious identities. It simply means seeing all those things in the context of the bigger picture. And I think that's, that's one of the, the, the biggest things, the most powerful things that we can do is not only broaden our tribe to, to include a tribe of earthlings, uh, and that doesn't just mean humans, uh, but also to include our definition of the word home to encompass the entire planet. This is our home planet. Home is earth. And so to put that in concrete terms, if, if some natural disaster happens or there's some there's some situation on one part of the, in one part of the world and we want to help. It's not that we're helping those poor people over there. We're helping us. It's this, we're helping, you know, our family. Um, so I'll stop there, but we, I'm sure we can go a lot. Yeah. Deeper. Again, like I, I feel like this entire interview, I'm just having these like goosebump chill experiences because <laughs> it's so visceral for me, this, you know, tuning into to what you're sharing and <laughs> this idea of landing 
just like the rock, the flower, the grass play, like it's home. It's, it's one home, right? Um, I actually just had the, the pleasure to interview uh, Jean-Pierre Gou from Paris and France, and he's one of the co-founders of the One Home Initiative. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. You're aware of that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah I, great. I, if not, I would have connected you because I, I think it's, it's a really great well, with Blue Turn, right? We started with Blue Turn, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think there is a lot that unites us, but I also really appreciate that you say it's not just including us earthlings as humans, but all species. And they, I guess, you know, this is quite a bit more of an indigenous understanding of the land as well. Like this planet is alive in itself. Like plants have, the like, trees have been here way before we were born, right? And so they're part of this incredible atmosphere and this, this powerful kind of infrastructure for life. And so my, my question, follow-up question to that, and I'm sure this, this passed your mind while you were in space, you know, is when you're up there, how do you relate to all the trash and pollution that we've created in the last probably just about 200 years? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's uh, disheartening. I mean, it's it's obvious from space. You can see the the you can see the effect of human impact on the planet clearly visible from space. But the overarching thing, when you look out the window of the ISS, when I looked out the window of the ISS, I, I saw predominantly an iridescent biosphere teeming with life. I mean, I saw a living planet. I, I saw a living, breathing organism uh, called Earth. And we're all a, a super organism, if you will, made up by the individual uh, living systems and, and living entities that, that, that are on the planet. What I didn't see was the global economy. Uh, I saw the effects of the global economy, but I didn't see the global economy. And so what's really obvious from the vantage point of space, and, and you shouldn't have to go to space for this to be obvious, but it's undeniably obvious from, from space, is that our entire system is upside down. So we treat everything, including the very life support systems of our planet, as the wholly owned subsidiary of the global economy. When the truth is, is it's the exact opposite. Our economy is dependent on society and society is dependent on and embedded in the biosphere. Um, and so we need, we need to restructure and reorganize those systems, not out of any ideology or eco-philosophy, but rather because this is the reality of the, of the world that we live in. So nations right now are primarily judged uh, and, and, and strive to increase their GDP, right? That's, that is the, the goal, the economic goal of a very, almost every country. There's, there's a couple of, of Just exceptions. Just a few that have already adapted, yeah. A couple, couple of <laughs> exceptions, but for the most part, every country on the planet, the big countries on the planet that do the most damage, uh, their primary objective is, is increasing GDP um, with no end. There is no end point to that. And so that means that, uh, that they're trying to maximize their consumption and maximize their production of goods and services, which obviously uses up resources on the planet. It, you shouldn't have to go to space to realize that unlimited, unconstrained, uh, never ending growth uh, on a planet of finite resources leads to a crash. <laughs> it's, you can't, it's impossible. You can't, it, it has an endpoint. it ends. It could either end well or it, it can end bad. And right now we're on a trajectory that's leading to, to disaster. And so, um, what's, what's clear from space is that we are living in a completely flipped uh, mindset and that we need to come up with new things that we're measuring, more important things that we measure uh, our, our success with. And, you know, that doesn't even mention the fact that the entire, you know, planetary society, uh, or I should say global, here's where global is the appropriate word. The entire global society has been rigged. Uh, it's been rigged to keep the impoverished poor, and it, it's been rigged to keep poor countries uh, dependent on development from from rich countries. And um, if you know the 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet were able to have uh, you know a, a, a quality of, of life that that the Western world and, and other parts of the world experience, uh, we would destroy the planet in the process. If we do it the same way, that, that this is such an interesting um, concept, right? Like. There is this, this misconception that we cannot provide food and shelter for 8 billion people, but we, we just can't provide it if they all live like Americans. It, well, you, know, that, you know what I'm saying? And, like, it, yeah. And we don't waste, uh, you know, I mean, we could probably feed the entire planet uh, on what is wasted every day. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is it, this is fascinating, Ron. I think, you know, this is a topic that comes up a lot in this podcast around GDP and like 
what are political actions, but then also what are the opportunities for them? Because political actions often have to meet the real time opportunities. And, and COVID obviously is a very interesting uh, time stamp, right? Like we we're seeing big nations rethink the way they want to reset and restart. Um, but also this is fascinating for me because when I heard you speak uh, in Davos this January in 20, 2020, yeah, uh, you made this distinction and you just, you just made it um, here on this podcast about global and planetary. And mm -hmm. when I heard you speak, actually, what dropped in for me is like an affirmation that I named the podcast Green Planet, Blue Planet, because many times I was like, why did I even do this? And a lot of my, you know, my choices and, and people who, who tune in regularly know this about me at this point, they come from deep states of meditation and they come from this like alone time in nature. And often it doesn't need to make sense even to my thinking mind, but it just follow it because I know this guidance carries me to places that I couldn't even dream of. And so when you mentioned the distinction between global and planetary back in January, I was like, wow, yes, that's why, that's why. And maybe, maybe you can just elaborate on that for a minute or two. Yeah, I mean, one of the ways I, I, I describe it is with COVID-19. You know, COVID-19, for the most part, is being um, you know, tackled from a national point of view. So, and maybe you know, if we really work together, we can, we can, we can manage it from a global point of view. Or any, just take any problem, any problem, any problem in the world, uh, you know, usually at best is, is handled on a national level or maybe, maybe a global level, right? Uh, we're not really good at either of those. We're particularly bad at trying to address things from a, from a global point of view. Like you look at climate change or global warming, for instance, you know, we haven't been able to do it, really anything, anything. Of, I mean, we had the Paris Climate Accords, of course, the U.S. pulled out of that. Um, but even that was not going to budge the needle uh, and it was not enforceable and, and there was all kinds of problems with that. So we're, we're pretty ineffective uh, from a global scale. And that's because we don't live on a globe. <laughs> we don't, global is our financial networks, our computer networks, it's, it's abstract lines covering a sphere. We live on a planet, the planet is called Earth and it is a deeply interconnected, interdependent living system. And so when you treat things from a global point of view, you treat things like the biosphere as a commodity to be exploited uh, and to, you treat the, earth, the natural systems of the earth of something to be dominated. Uh, and you treat people as, you know, uh, numbers of a, of a work, you know, numbers on a spreadsheet, whether that's a workforce or a consumer group or, or whatever. So, so people are not treated as valued member, members of a human family and you know, all the living systems on the planet are not treated as integral, integral parts of an overarching life support system that, that maintains all life on this planet, right? And so that, that's to me what the difference between global and planetary. I think we need to get global out of our, out of our dictionaries and, and out of our, we need to start talking about things from a planetary point of view. And when you talk about things from the planetary point of view, one of the things is that we bring the biosphere into the equation. We bring, you know, there, the, when you talk about the cost of a good produced, you know, it has to, it has to include the cost to the biosphere. Yeah. You know, I mean, whether that's the extraction of, of fossil fuels, you know, that don't include that, that cost. Um, but, you know, we need, to, we need to look at real costs and mm -hmm. as one, one small example of, of ways that, planetary versus global is, is different. I, I love it. And I, I love how, how clear, you know, it, it comes through in the way you're explaining it. And actually, when you talk about true cost, um, this was one of the, one of the previous episodes with a company called true cost that maps out the true cost of the environment. Um, but I think it goes even beyond that. If we, if we look at the planetary intelligence and the life support system, as you call it, that is the planet. Now suddenly a complete different level of intelligence and possibility opens up of resonance, of resonance technologies, of, of, of ways that nature interacts that in our old uh, physical paradigms might, you know, might be challenged, might need to be challenged, and might need yeah. to change over time. And what, what, we've, what we fail to acknowledge is that the, the, the first victim of global warming, the first victim of COVID-19, the first victim of any of these things is the economy. I mean, that's what's gonna, that's what's gonna, so instead of, instead of putting investment into making us more resilient uh, and more environmentally resilient and socially resilient and everything else, which creates jobs and creates, I mean, does all the things that the economists say we need to do, uh, we, we keep going back to the old way of doing things. And the, and the reason we do is because we have entrenched 
We have entrenched monopolies, we have entrenched interests, we have entrenched power centers uh, that like the status quo just the way it is, and they're gonna fight tooth and nail to, to, to solve it. And, you know, we, we've got a lot of, a lot of deep-rooted systemic problems uh, in, our, in our society. And when I say society, I don't just mean America, I mean across the world. Um, and there's a lot of things we can do to fix that. Um, none of that's going to be successful unless we, unless we first um, transcend our, our, our basic core problem. And our basic core problem is this false sense of separation that we all have amongst each other, amongst our nations, amongst the other living things that we share the biosphere with. That we have, um, throughout the course of human uh, evolution, have evolved to have individual egos that uh, survive in us by deceiving us to believe that uh, you and I are completely separate, that there's not, there's, there's, there's not a connection. And until we all realize that, we're, that we really truly are all part of one human family, we're not going to be able to solve this. And that's a cliche itself, you know, be part of one human family. What does that even mean? Well, in, a physical, in physical terms, it means, in most literal terms, it means if we, if we go back far enough, literally, literally every single person on the planet came from the same mother and the same father. We literally are all related. But there is a level of unity that goes beyond the physicality of DNA. You know, there is, there is an underlying unity of the universe, never mind the planet, never mind humanity, that we are, that we are all a part of. Um, and again, our egos deceive us from, from realizing that. And when we address our systemic problems, you know, when we rebuild a system that works for everyone, when we rebuild a system where we could reach equilibrium in seven generations down the line, we can look back and realize this great moment of transition. Um, when we realize that underlying unity, our problem solving process, our governance, our, our environmental efforts, everything changes. Because even, even, you know, I've done a lot of development work. I've a lot of, done a lot of humanitarian development work. And even in that sector where you would assume everybody's in it for the right reasons and everybody's doing, it is one of the most uh, dysfunctional sectors of our society. And, and there's tremendous egos running around and tremendous competition. And I don't mean good competition. I mean, destructive competition, yeah. lying, cheating, corruption, uh, because it's ego driven. Even something is, is altruistic or seemingly altruistic is, you know, trying to bring clean water to people in, in, right. in the world. I mean, it's hard to separate the message from the, the medium, right? And so if the medium is within the global financial system, then this is just a Band-aid on, on, on the problems. You, Ron, you answered a question that I, I was about to ask, but I didn't even ask, which is... I sense that. I sense yeah. that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. There's this unity that we're, that's underneath the surface that we don't... You were present in the interbeing, 100%. <laughs> it's, it's, it's how do we learn from our past mistakes, right? And it, it is this, this number one big divide of like b believing in the illusion of separation. Well, so I have, I have another question. I have two other questions for you in, in, in this podcast. One is just to get a little bit deeper into the way maybe you, you perceive light and live. And so I've asked this over 200 people now because I believe trust is one of the emerging qualities we need in this kind of uh, evolution that we're in. And so, Ron, for you as a, as a human being, what does it take to experience trust? So that's an that's a interesting question because it all hinges on your definition of the word trust, right? So, I mean, I trust that everybody is trying to do the right thing, I guess. Um, so well, let, me, let me answer that in the most basic, basic way, I guess most theoretical way, um, is I trust somebody who we both have an understanding of our un underlying unity, that, that there's, there's a connection there. I, 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 realize that connection the person the other person realizes that connection and together we are working collaboratively to uh, create some type of, of good in the world that, that's the most basic but i think there's a lot of mistrust in the world there's a lot of divisiveness in the world there's and and most if not all of that comes from from fear and so um trust trust is, is, is what's required to motivate action, right? So if you're, if you're collaborative action, if you're going to work with other people, there has to be some level of, of trust there. And so, um, yeah, it's, uh, 
one one of the th there's two i think there's two major ways that we can motivate action right one is through uh fear uh fear is a, is a great motivator of action it's not always a great motivator of good action but it's a great motivator of action but there's also i think a more powerful motivator of action of real action of real positive action and that's on wonder and there is there is profound on wonder that can be found in the recognition of of the unity of the breaking down of the separate self of the of the breaking down of the walls band and boundaries that our fear induced psyche has has erected and there is incredible divisiveness in the world right now that is that is for the most part like i said fear based and everybody has their own start i, mean, I know this is going to get a little bit long but i but bear with me if you can there, everybody has their own starting, what I call starting condition. And on the space station, when we, when we do procedures, you know, these big, long, multi-page, very highly choreographed, highly detailed procedures go, come up and they assume a certain starting condition that all the cables are, are a certain way, all the switches are a certain way, you know, every, everything is where it's supposed to be. A lot of times these big, thick, you know, lengthy procedures come up and they assume the wrong starting conditions. And so the, the procedure is completely worthless. And a lot of times when we brought that up to the ground, the ground refused or was really reluctant to adjust the procedure because so much work that it was put into that procedure, uh, it didn't matter that it couldn't be worked. It, you know, we, we need to, we need to, they were unwilling to adjust their starting, to, to, uh, to change their starting condition, their perception of their starting condition because they were part of the problem. They were, they were within the problem. They, and the problem was that, they're, they were tainted by the fact that somebody put a lot of work into these procedures and they needed to be, to be changed. So right now, what you, it's a long story to illustrate this point. Right now, so, pe so many people are so entrenched in their own starting conditions that when facts are presented that challenge their starting conditions, instead of, instead of changing their or adjusting their starting conditions, they change the facts, right? And they set up this us versus them where if I acknowledge any merit whatsoever in your position, that means that you will win and I will lose, right? And so they can't, they can't even give you even the slightest bit of merit to, to the other side, right? This us, us versus them world. So your question, was, your question started on trust. So I think part of trust is understanding, understanding that everybody is coming from their own starting conditions. Uh, not everybody realizes the underlying a unity that that connects us, which is the which is the fabric of life that connects all of us. Uh, people are coming from different places, and you need to meet people where they're at, right? And you need to understand that everybody is is struggling with their own challenges and their own problems. And you know, even though they don't agree with what you're saying, um, that doesn't mean they're a bad person. That doesn't mean that they're 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 not intelligent. That it just means that they're dealing with their own stuff and. Uh, we need we need to use that as a tool for compassion, and you know the, the example I gave with the International Space Station is setting aside our differences, find the low hanging mm -hmm. fruit, work on the things that you agree on, build a relationship, build a level of trust, and then use that as a platform to try and address the things that you don't agree on from that foundation of trust, not from a foundation of animosity and aggression. That was a beautiful answer, Ron. I a little long, but sorry. I'll let that one sink in too. I I, I like all the answers on trust because I I think it's it's uh, highly personal as well, right? Um, and gets us to a whole other topic that we can't cover today. That is, if we're even asking the right questions, you know, if the starting conditions are not in the right place, maybe we should ask different kind of questions to make sure our starting uh, setup is, is actually supporting the kind of inquiry and experience we want to have. And Well, I think, I think the right question to ask is, first and foremost, is what do we have in common? Hmm. What, what is it that we agree on? Let's talk about that first and then, and then work from there. Hmm. Well, so that brings me to my last question and I could not not ask it because you, you left this planet and came back. And so, you know, we talked a lot about the life on this planet and the way that there is life and that connects us all. So when you're out there, how can I, how can I picture that? Is there, is there any experience uh, of, of life in and around you? Or is, is the blackness just all en en encompassing? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of life around us. It's, it's all contained on the earth. Um, so 
are you asking me if I think there's, there's alien life? Is that what you're asking me? Or no, I'm not asking you if you think there's alien life. I'm asking you if there was any other life that captured your attention other than the planet Earth. No. No, I mean, there's the possibility of life. I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't uh, proclaim to think that we're the only, that the only life in the universe is on Earth. I, I think that's possible. I think it's highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's almost, uh, it's almost a statistical certainty that there is life elsewhere, um, but anything's possible. Um, but, you know, my, my experience with the universe being in space um, was just fascination on wonder. And it wasn't just on wonder of the planet, uh, on wonder of the Milky Way, on wonder of the, you know, the, the heavenly bodies, I can see. It was on wonder of what's between it. It's, it's just the vast emptiness. And so out on a spacewalk, you know, there's just a little piece of fabric separating you from the entire universe, from the, from the emptiness and the, and the vacuum of the, of the entire universe. And uh, that, that itself was awe-inspiring. Mm. Just the vast emptiness um, was inspiring. And that vast emptiness was required. Without that vast emptiness, there would be no universe. Oh. So, so there, there's this, this play. I mean, there's this dance between matter and, and what's between the matter. And uh, I think that was, that was really fascinating and awe-inspiring. Thank you for sharing your awe and that wonder with us today in this episode. Okay. Thank you so much for your time, Ron. It's my pleasure. My pleasure.